Well, thank you, folks. I'm watching our, uh, it's like watching the leaderboard on our uh, participant list here in, in Connect Pro, and uh, it's fun to watch people joining us. So it is really a pleasure this morning to introduce and to welcome uh, Dan Hickey and uh, James Willis to join our Coil Conversations. As you know, Coil Conversations are sort of a, uh, intended to be a dialogue between experts in the field and our community. You know, we really appreciate uh, Dan and James taking time to join us today. So for those of you who don't know Dan and his reputation, uh, Dan is the Director of the Learning Sciences at the School of Education at Indiana University of Bloomington. Uh, he was awarded a $400,000 grant by the MacArthur Foundation Digital Media and Learning Initiative to examine how digital badges record and display achievements and accomplishments and how they can be used to recognize, assess, motivate, and evaluate learning. So again, it comes down to this impact of an innovation in a pedagogical approach tied with a technological solution and, and how might that change what we know about teaching and learning. James Willis is a research associate in the Center for Research on Learning and Technology at Indiana University. He's an associate of BAMS. They work together and they're going to co-present today on um, open badges. BAMS got lots of, I can just tell you, and brief conversations with him over the last two days. Lots of uh, very interesting ideas and things to consider and get you thinking. Uh, by the way, of our format, folks, is that we will have, uh, we've asked Dan and James to speak for a half hour or 35 or so minutes, and then um, you can, but, but during that time, you can also uh, generate questions on our uh, chat box. And uh, I will be watching that chat box and uh, translating anything back to uh, Dan and Chris. And then we'll open up and have some dialogue. In, uh, in a bit and uh, get some exchange going on. So uh, again, thank you, James and Dan, and we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lawrence. That was awesome. Uh, really happy to be here. It's really an honor to be there. You guys are, uh, of course, w very well known for all your, your fine work there, and uh, it's really it's, it's an honor. So thanks for the invitation. So. Of course, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the MacArthur Foundation, in particular uh, Connie Owl, uh, the head of education in the Digital Media and Learning Program. So just a very quick background. I'm going to assume that most people on this talk are pretty well grounded with badges, so I'm not going to go through the whole story. I'll just give a, give a quick sort of four-year run. Um, uh, it, we should always give credit to P2PU. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer university, Philip Schmidt and his colleagues. Uh, many of the core ideas actually emerge in interaction between P2PU and Mozilla around 2010. Um, that was when this sort of core idea that if we uh, if we gave credentials which could contain actual claims of learning and evidence and links to evidence, and that information circulated in social networks, that um, that would be a game changer. And uh, I. Uh, did some investigations for the MacArthur Foundation in 2010. Uh, one into sort of looking into the what kind of innovation was going to come out of race at the top, uh, and basically nothing was the conclusion, uh, and that it was going to be quite problematic these new assessment reforms. And uh, also into um, the uh, looking at U.S. foundations, what they were doing innovative assessment, and, and basically the answer was nothing. And, and uh, MacArthur responded in 2011 with the open badges for a digital media and learning competition, the badges for lifelong learning. There's Arnie Duncan kicking it off in 2011. They got 600 proposals, funded 30 of them. Uh, through 2012, there's Connie Yowell, Mark Sherman, and uh, David Thiel Goldberg on stage with uh, Bill Clinton promising 2 million badges around the Clinton Global Initiative. And there at the bottom you see uh, in 2012, 2014, that's Aaron Knight and everybody kicking off uh, the Badge Alliance. So that's just sort of a chronology uh, of open digital badges. I do want to make a shout out for our prior project. We're just wrapping this up. I'm not talking about this today. I will be. I'm doing talks about this in, uh, in Sydney and Melbourne, LA and uh, Boston uh, in this coming week weeks, but um, I'm not going to talk about it today. We're just wrapping this project up. Uh, James is, is the coordinator of this project, uh, and my team, uh, we had a great time studying the 30 projects that they funded, so 
We have a, a database of uh, design principles. We can give you some, some good answers of what people were able to do and what they weren't able to do and why uh, in terms of using open digital badges for recognizing, assessing, motivating, and studying learning. So some of you may have seen the slide before. This is actually the first two quotes to our inspiration for the prior project. Carla Casilli, who's at the Badge Alliance and who's been a huge uh, collaborator, pointed out regardless of where you start, it's likely to end up somewhere other than your intended destination. That's okay. Systems are living things and your system needs to be flexible. You need to embrace a bit of chaos in its design. And anybody who's tried to develop a badge system knows that, that actually uh, defining learning outcomes, coming up with evidence of those outcomes, and then allowing it to be uh, circulate in a social network can be very disruptive for a learning ecosystem. Um, the challenge in our prior project was capturing this wisdom in the trial and error. As Philip Crutchin talked about large uh, complex architecture, uh, software architecture, most of the knowledge generated when designing complex systems evaporates as features evolve and teams dissolve. And that really was quite a challenge for uh, us to capture that knowledge uh, before it evaporated. What we're running into now, though, is this interesting thing that because these systems get so complex uh, as they evolve, extra resources are needed to preserve and simplify the structure. This is sort of the first law of software architecture design. The second law, but a system needs to be used in a real world environment, must change or become progressively less useful in that environment. And I believe this is what we're running into in the work we're going to talk about today, which is uh, it, it really is hard to make these major changes. Um, people don't even know, especially open source systems, um, they become quite quite challenging, frankly. And that's the challenge that I want to talk about today, that, that building in an in innovation like, well, I guess I've lost my camera. I'll just go ahead and talk. So today what I want to talk about is three things, what James and I are going to talk about. One is, what's the current state of the art of badges in the major higher education learning management system? Um, raise your hand if you know whose tattoo that is. It's dedication. I, I've never met Chuck Severance, but I think anybody who's so into learning management systems that he's got them tattooed on his arm must be an awesome person to meet. I also wonder now that Sakai does seem to have gone uh, going away, whether he's going to have to get that erased like a divorced girl, uh, ex-girlfriend or something. But. What you see there is sort of a nice overview of this, you know, this landscape of learning management systems. So first we'll talk about some of them and where badges are at in that. Then we're going to talk about the interesting entrepreneurial landscape that's, that's growing around badges and, and uh, how people can take advantage of that. Then we'll talk about uh, uh, the sort of the, the nonprofits that are emerging around it as well. So first I'll start with Google Course Builder because um, it's an interesting example. Uh, uh, this is my course. Uh, I was given a grant from Google uh, in 2012 to use the then new Google Course Builder platform, uh, and, and, and which was enough resources, but also a nimble enough platform. It's only 5,000 lines of Python. Uh, and I had a very gifted programmer to work with me. And among the many fun things we did were some really great digital badges. You, uh, my course was here you can see um, uh, part one, one, right? So there's four units, four wiki folios that they had to complete and then an exam that they had to take uh, on the practices of educational assessment. And uh, I had students who were taking the course for credit, but most of the students were taking it as an open course. If you uh, completed those modules and you took uh, and you, you took the exam, you earned that assessment practices badge. Now, do you see on the right there the one that says leader? Well, if you, in the process of completing your work and interacting with your classmates, got more peer promotions, more peers said that your work was exemplary than anyone else in your group, your version of the badge actually said leader. There's the course completion badge that you earned if you earned all three badges and, and took the final. And then in the 2014 version, we actually gave this customizable expert badge if students took the contents of their wiki folio and, and turned it into a term paper that I deemed to be an acceptable piece. And we got five or six of those. People wanted that badge. What was really cool was the way that we were able to uh, 
when we talk about evidence-rich badges. If you clicked on, on the course completion badge for that particular person, this is what pulled up. And if you clicked on the badge itself, this, this is what pulled up. There you can see, uh, this is Marina Michael. She uh, is a, uh, someone who I knew in this class and gave me permission. She did eventually earn the leader badge, but over here on the left, um, you can see, by the way, my cursor's not showing, is it? So on the left, you can see the units that she completed for completing, uh, that she had to complete to earn that badge. And if you click on those units right there, if I click on Unit 8, Standardized Testing, you actually pull up, this is literally what you see. In black is the instructions on the assignment, and in the yellow is the work that she completed. Now, you don't see, for example, the comments that her classmates gave on her work, because we blinded that for privacy purposes. But you do actually see over there in the brown box is the peer uh, endorsements is being complete. And you can see that although she did not get any peer promotions on that particular one, but she did on the later ones. And so this is what we mean by allowing evidence and claims to circulate in social networks. So one of the things we want to talk about today is the status of this. Um, as you may know, in 2013, Google announced that they were basically merging with the Open edX platform. Um, I was in Zurich this summer for a Google Course Builder workshop. Um, it, I honestly don't know whether that's going to happen. Um, it's very much up in the air. Uh, a lot of people really, really like the nimbleness of the uh, uh, course builder platform. Many people there, including the engineers at Google, were chafing under the, the, the massive the 500,000 lines of Python that make up Open edX. So nonetheless, we're going for Open edX because so many more people are using Open edX. Google Course Builder is a relatively modest platform. It's not in that wide use, whereas you have thousands of people using Open edX and millions of learners. So here's a blog post at Remediating Assessment announcing our new project. Um, basically, what we've been funded to do for two years is to advance uh, high quality uses of badges, both in terms of the software, but also the case examples. So what we're going to show you now is the very initial beginnings of an open case library of what we consider to be sort of exemplary uses of digital badges in higher education. Uh, we started out with Badge Kit, um, which was a Mozilla uh, issuing platform that was supposed to be the sort of the, the, ja uh, the sort of Swiss Army knife for uh, badging solutions. And I'm afraid to say it hasn't worked out. Badge Kit is uh, for all intents and purposes, over, and we're moving. In. We spent four months trying to make Badge Kit work with Open edX, and, and uh, I'll know in a week whether we're using any elements of Badge Kit. But here's what we did: we're working with uh, Lorena Barba. She's a very talented uh, instructor at George Washington University, and we're literally, as we speak, um, building Open Digital Badges into her Python MOOC. Um, now, what the challenge is that we're quickly encountering is that Open edX really is very complex. Finding the seams in that massive collection of features, as they describe it, it's not really a platform yet, but it really is a collection of features, um, has really been a big challenge. Uh, right now, IBL Studios, uh, who did the technical build on Open edX for Lorena's course, are finding the seams. We're working with Achievery. Uh, to have already built the API for sharing and issuing badges. And I, we should have that up on our blog uh, showing exactly what happened in time for, for the Open edX technical conference next week. Uh, one of the most interesting things is that uh, one of the problems we encountered was that the authentication process thwarted efforts to put course evidence in the badges, right? So the, the best thing about badges is, like I showed you, you can put that information right in the badge. Well, you can't do that in Open edX because people have to be authenticated to access that information. So the solution that Lorena came up with that I'm really excited about is that students will be able to insert links to their code that they generated in their assignments from GitHub to show that evidence. So we hope to have that to show you by November 19th. Canvas uh, 
is an interesting platform. It's uh, right now there's two apps. There's uh, Credit Trusts, Badge Safe app, and Badge Stacks app. Both of those are at the uh, EDU App Center, and uh, both of them now work with Canvas. This is a very quick look at what we just literally spent. It took us about a week to get the app installed, and this is the IU Enterprise uh, test version. So this is an enterprise version of Canvas. So what you see here is um, uh, this is the Badge Safe plugin. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, there you. Uh, uh, I'm just going to skip it in the interest of time. I'm just going to give you a little idea. Here you see uh, this is what the participants would see. This is sort of the uh, criteria for an assignment. We're testing this out in a faculty development context. Uh, once the assignment's completed, uh, that gives the sort of the criteria. Who did you consult with? Um, this is the what the moderator sees. Uh, uh, so this says the one IU accessibility bronze badge, right? So we're giving faculty badges for completing uh, modules on accessibility uh, for d disabled people in their online courses. Um, here you see a list of everyone who's claimed this badge, who's earned this badge. And there's the actual badge itself. Now, uh, Maggie, when she made these, she did not choose to make them uh, uh, give people the option to push them out to a Mozilla backpack. But this is a really, really crucial thing that I want to take just a second to talk about. Uh, the Accredit Trust, which, uh, disclosure, I should say I'm on the advisory board of Accredit Trust, but I'm not paid, but um, they worked very hard to build the API for to plug into Canvas. Um, it should be, the code should be on GitHub in about a week. Um, it needs a lot of work. It's going to need it's open source. They're hoping that people will work on it. Their business model is that uh, at this point you could choose to push it out to a proprietary uh, system that they call TrueCred, where it could be its authenticity could be verified, or you could push it out to the Mozilla Backpack where it could not. For instance, it, it could never be revoked. For example, so this issue of of how badges are being pushed out and shared is a really important one, and we'll, hopefully we'll get some questions about that later. In the interest of time, though, we're going to move on to Blackboard. You're all familiar with Blackboard. James, I'm going to let you drive it from here for a little while. Sure. Um, so Blackboard is a proprietary learning management system, um, and many of you are probably familiar with the major learning initiatives that they have, learning analytics, student retention. Um, but they acquire a lot of products in the education uh, tech world um, and that they are trying to reimagine education. So this is some very new information here. Um, in February of 2014 at the Reconnect Learning Summit, Blackboard pledged to, quote, support open badges in my EDU, a platform that helps college students create a roadmap tailored to their academic and career goals. Um, in June of 2014, the CEO um, indicated that they were building this. And so I, I had a, a brief conversation with Deb Everhart at Blackboard um, who shared with me that as of May, uh, the Blackboard profile formerly in, in Blackboard Learn has been moved to my EDU. Um, and that currently what Blackboard is calling achievements are actually tiles within my EDU. And you can see those in the bottom right of the screen. Um, but they're soon going to be over we are compliant badges and that those will be pushed to my EDU. So the big point here is that in the near future, Blackboard will use the platform that they acquired, my, my EDU, as an alternative to the Mozilla backpack. Um, and the users will be able to move any OBI compliant badge into the my EDU profile no matter the issuer. Um, they're still working up the timeline at the moment, uh, but they are committed to making this happen. Okay, so in terms of what they're actually recognizing for uh, teaching, what they call um, recognizing or achievements, um, this fits broadly within the categories of badges and completion certificates. Um, institutions within Blackboard Learn can enable badges administratively um, or disable them if they choose. Um, many of the schools are just now beginning to use badges, so a lot of um, institutions have turned them off. 
um, or they're kind of sort of playing it by ear, if you will. Um, and once an earner gets a badge, it's optional to push it publicly if he or she chooses. So within the issuer's experience, um, Blackboard provides a catalog of images that instructors or administrators can choose from, um, allowing for customized images as well. Um, the issuer name is pre-populated based on the administrator's settings, um, and, and they also have the expiry date um, that they can set for a badge to expire. So, so if you're an earner and you're in Blackboard and you receive a badge, um, you're able to see all the different criteria and you're able to make uh, things public. And you can opt to push this to Mozilla Backpack or, as we just discussed, um, soon we'll be able to push it um, to my EDU. Um, so you can see all the different um, badges that you um, that you accomplish in the various different criteria that go into earning them. Blackboard also has a number of case studies available on their website where they talk about different scenarios and different levels of education and how those badges are being used. So I'll talk briefly about Moodle. Uh, many of you probably use this as well. Um, you know that it's free, open source, um, adaptable, extendable, modifiable, um, and that they are led by Moodle HQ, uh, which is an Australian company of 30 developers, and they're financially supported by 60 partner service companies. Um, and they make it so that you can build in uh, badges, but also use their existing badge system. So the public badge collections in Backpack will display in the profile, and they offer site badges, which are the site-wide activities, like finishing a group of courses, but you can also have them specific to the course. Um, and have those related to specific activities. Um, Moodle actually has, has a very helpful PDF that you can go into. It's only about four pages um, that describe the process of issuing a badge, setting expiry dates, um, being able to customize that. Uh, they're fully compatible with Mozilla Open Badges, and they're displayed on the user's profile, or they can be pushed to the Open Badges backpack. So if you're an issuer, um, you just it, it's very simple. You, you create a badge name, a description, an image, um, user details. Um, it's fairly standard. Uh, Moodle has this built in. And Brightspace is the actual uh, LMS that they're using um, if you are a D2L uh, desire to learn. So the end Within Brightspace, they have about 1,100 clients or 15 million learners. Um, and D2L is working in higher education, K-12, healthcare, government, enterprise. Um, you may have heard of D2L in their learning analytics. They are ramping this up currently. So D2L actually, uh, what's interesting about them is, is that they make a, a very explicit um, point of saying that they want to gamify their courses. Um, this doesn't appear in other LMSs as clearly, but uh, D2L does talk about this, um, and that they can allow instructors to manually award the badges um, or help facilitate the badge man management system. So if you're an issuer in D2L, um, again, it's fairly straightforward. Badge name, description, criteria, expirations is very similar to Moodle. And if you're the earner, um, you have the remote plugin that allows learners to see what badges they can earn in a course. Um, they receive a notification in a mini bar, and a lot like other LMSs, students are able to um, accept the badge or not, um, and the earner retains full control over it. Um, and like other LMSs, they can push out to social media like Twitter and Facebook. All right, Dan, I'll hand it back over to you to talk about Achievery. entrepreneurs now. Um, so one of the points before I dive into this that I want to make though is that, that what we have in our new project is we do have support and resources to collaborate with institutions who are interested in doing innovative work with badges. We're actively recruiting people. We're Right now we're at a phase where we're working very, very closely with people to do things that haven't been done before, building up a case library, and then sharing that out and, and sort of scaling up our efforts. So. Uh, we welcome people to contact us if they're 
interested in partnering with us. We have a very talented team um, and a fair amount of experience that I think we're in a position to lend. And one of the things that we really think that we, uh, particularly over the next year, will be in the position to do is to help people find the right people to partner up with. And much of that help will come in the form of the entrepreneurs. So Carrie Lamont and Damien uh, Evans were both working at uh, the Providence After School Alliance, uh, which was one of the projects we studied in the previous one. And they, they wisely recognized this opportunity to really break out and, and start a company to support them the way that we saw uh, 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 Moodle rooms, for example, uh, lots of entrepreneurial action around Moodle. Um, and so we're seeing the same thing happen here. So part of our job is doing some brokering. Uh, we are actually currently working with Carrie and Damien on the, uh, the project with Lorena Barba. Uh, um, they, uh, uh, their specialties are in the support of, of uh, credential systems. But they do competency-based work. They do it in schools. Uh, they, they know how to build uh, really usable systems that work with people. Uh, and that they, they've got a lot of experience. They probably have more experience with sort of the human side of digital badges than, 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 than a lot of people out there. So that's been very interesting to work with them. They kind of, uh, they help, help to build the ecosystem, the badges ecosystem to start with. Um, second company uh, that we're also I'm uh, working with, again, these Accredit Trust is the company who uh, did the plug-in for Canvas. Uh, Eric Corb and Mary Bold, uh, very talented folks. One of the interesting things about a credit trust that should be particularly interesting to schools, you can see it right there on their home page. What they're all about is the security of the credentials. So uh, they have a very sophisticated digital verification system. Uh, so if you're using a true cred um, uh, portfolio system, you can basically, they will guarantee that that person really did earn that credential that is in there. It's pretty much impossible to prank it. And uh, as many people have pointed out, that is not the case with the Mozilla backpack. Uh, Ginger Malwin is at Badge Cert. Uh, we've recently spoken with her. Uh, and there you see their take is uh, a little bit different. Uh, Ginger indicated that, that it's possible for badges that they issue to be open. But, but she said none of their clients want it. In fact, where they really work is in this uh, professional associations. So as they point out on their website, there's 90,000 professional associations with 25 million members. And many of them have some sort of certification. So Badge Cert, uh, uh, also a, a small company, is carving off that space. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about them that, uh, that I quite liked is that uh, it was interesting talking with Ginger because she really had a lot of experience with what, how badges change things and how, as I mentioned earlier, how disruptive it can be. Um, just the simple move from a paper certificate to a digital certificate. Um, uh, you know, she 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 talks she told some nice stories about you know how the you know the president of the association says, yeah, we like those badges, let's use them. You know, and then actually. There's a lot of steps that have to happen between somebody saying, yeah, let's get badges, and actually issuing badges that, that sort of work, so to speak. So uh, in addition to their badging service, Ginger offers uh, a, is a consultancy that will come in and work with companies to do this heavy lifting that has to happen to, uh, to make that work. James, you want to add anything about badge, sir? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that they've kind of carved out um, this niche with professional development, uh, whereas a lot of badging companies and, and that are developing APIs to go directly into learning management systems, uh, badge cert can do that as well. But the, the niche that they're carving out really is professional development, and I think there's a lot of room for growth there. As you can see, they've got you know they have this pretty sophisticated set of tools on their badge cert platform um, that, that have a lot of knowledge sort of bound up in. Them. And this sort of gets at another point that I want to make before uh, before we wind it down. Um, what, what's really interesting about badges, and one of the reasons that, that you know many of us are so excited about them, uh, is the the way that the practical wisdom sort of travels with them. If it, there's this notion of phrenesis, as as Aristotle called it, um, uh, and this and and so. Uh, 
Rich Halverson is a very talented uh, theorist at Wisconsin, and he has this notion of the artifact, uh, artifact oriented frenetic narrative. Right? That's a fancy way of saying there's a bunch of narrative wisdom, practical wisdom hands-on practical stuff of how to solve real problems that is traveling through multiple educational ecosystems associated with badges. And that is probably the thing that drew me to badges more than anything, is recognizing that, that, that people don't have to start from scratch, that, people can, that, that there's wisdom built into all of these features there that, that people can take advantage of and, to, and that can solve uh, old problems that have been nagging and actually tackle new problems as they come up. So that's what's really exciting to us is to watch this ecosystem emerge and that, that, that they're actually, um, you know, there's this wisdom that's, that's moving around this space that people can draw on to solve problems. So another one is Open Badge Factory. I love uh, Eric and Helsinki. You can get the whole uh, Scandinavian vibe. If you just look at the layout of their site, you know, you can see it looks kind of sparse and spare. And, and they're, um, they're looking to sort of avoid the fragmentation. They're really buying into the, 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 the beauty of open badges and, and interoperability, but also solving some of the many problems that, that come with them as well. So what we're hoping to do in our project is engage with these people. We do have, a, it's not a huge project, but we actually have enough re resources to do some subcontracting to sort of let, you know, open badge factory help them build something for someone else uh, who agrees to, to work with us to do an open case library. Uh, like all of these ones, they're OBI compliant. Um, and currently it's free, and that's an interesting thing. I would encourage people to look at them. Uh, in particular, they're going to move into a tiered, a freemium tiered model in 2015. Uh, this is a good pick for, uh, for Moodle and Mahara. Um, OBF is not open source. So this is a really interesting thing uh, that's ha happening. Is that people are, the business model that's emerging here is that people have a proprietary uh, um, displaying systems and, and tools, um, but the plugins themselves are open source, and so there's a lot of opportunity for customization. And this is what I meant by this sort of wisdom traveling. Well, it can travel with these plugins as well. Of course, we have to talk about Pearson. Um, they're not exactly an entrepreneur, but uh, Acclaim is their uh, enterprise uh, badging solution. It is also OBI compliant. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds. James, you want to chime in? Yeah, so um, to connect Acclaim back with Badge Cert, one of the more recent um, badge initiatives has been building into LinkedIn. So where Acclaim has this Badge Cert um, that we've discussed that has the professional development type badges linked uh, that they are able to connect in with LinkedIn, which is an interesting um, connection between the educational aspect and professional certifications and how those are recognized. Okay. Uh, so, of course, Credly. Um, uh, they're OBI compliant in some ways, but uh, there's been some controversy around Credly, the way that they uh, went forward with their WordPress system. But uh, you can see there that there is their Canvas plugin. Uh, Credly has been very successful, for instance, uh, if you present at Educause, you get a badge, and it's in Credly. Um, their their business model appears just to be uh, moving along at a fast clip. They've been uh, really recruiting some fairly sophisticated partnerships with people. Uh, now, we'll very quickly just talk about the nonprofit uh, landscape. A lot of volunteers, a lot of uh, nonprofits, and bringing people together. Of course, Badge Alliance. So the story with Badge Alliance is that the six, the, the Brain Trust at Mozilla behind uh, digital badges at Mozilla all moved uh, into the Badge Alliance, which was formed after a big kickoff meeting uh, in January of this year. There you see the team. Um, that's what they look like. I didn't have a slide that had their names and their pictures, but there's their names. Carla Casilli, Aaron Knight is the director. Sonny Lee, Chris McAvoy, Jade Forrester, and Megan Cole. And there you can see on the bottom, there is the steering committee, a very influential group of folks, including Chuck Severance, uh, whose tattoo I showed you earlier. So uh, lots of great stuff happening there. Uh, I really encourage people to get on board. Uh, the, they're, they're sort of reorienting themselves right now. They've just finished a big six-month six, six month, uh, 
work. We're actually going to be uh, giving them an update right after this meeting. Um, there you see the badges for higher education is one of the working groups. Uh, there's, uh, there's one for professionals. Um, here you see the other ones. Again, there's, a, there's a, a special one on the endorsements. So there's a lot of really interesting, smart folks doing some pretty great stuff here. It's also a great way to connect up with other people. Um, I just can't say enough about what I've learned from working with uh, Mozilla and now Badge Alliance. They really know how to build a community. Um, for example, uh, Nate Otto, who some of you may know, who was James' predecessor, that's how I met Nate, was through the, uh, the Mozilla Working Group. So there's really a vibrant community emerging around open badges. Um, and I'll close with um, a pitch. Uh, a nice complimentary piece of work is going on within the Edge Across Micro-Credentials uh, and Badges constituent group. Brian Blakely is uh, with me as the group leaders, but I will say that Brian is by far more uh, active and successful than I have been. We held a meeting at the organizing meeting in Florida. Um, we'll, um, we'll be presenting at the Educause uh, Learning Initiative meeting in January. So I really want to encourage everybody to um, get on board with these groups. Uh, lots of great stuff is coming together and lots of opportunities for collaboration. So that was all we brought to present today. I think that was my last slide. So we're almost on time. Terrific. Dan, thank you. And James, thank you so much for um, setting the table for this uh, exploration. I, I think um, to your point, Dan, earlier on, lots of individuals have sort of a broad conceptual understanding of, of badges and where badges fit in the ecosystem. Um, I think your, your discussion today really helped us focus in a little bit. And uh, I, my guess is we've generated some questions. Um, one of the questions from our uh, online, this is actually from Kyle, he asks about how bad, how the acclaim system, which is Pearson's product, is fitting into uh, LinkedIn. Uh, James, you provided a link there. Would you explain that to us? Yeah, so this is actually one of the newer initiatives uh, to be able to connect in with LinkedIn, uh, whereas Twitter and other social media um, tend to be a little bit easier to connect into. Uh, LinkedIn has been, um, you know, a bit more challenging. But at this point, it's it's become um, kind of a, a major initiative for badging systems to be able to do so. Um, I provided a few links in there to discuss um, this link with the claim. Uh, from what I gather, it is a fairly new thing. So you know, in terms of details, um, being able to push links out, uh, or, sorry, being able to push badges out to LinkedIn is a fairly new thing. Um, so not a whole lot is known on that on the research and things. Or, you know, I think what's going to be interesting too, um, companies like BadgeCert have learning analytics, uh, an analytics system built into um, their badge issuing. And I think what's going to be fascinating as we go into the next year is being able to determine, you know, with more precision exactly what happens with these badges in, in, um, in the workplace. So, you know, you, you graduate with a college degree, with a graduate degree, and you go out into the workforce, and you're supposed to have these skills. Um, badges provide a granularity where you can demonstrate those skills. So if you put it out there in social media like LinkedIn, what effect does that have, and how do you measure that? I think you're going to see some um, things coming about to measure those methodologically that don't currently exist, because I think those raise very challenging um, questions in terms of measurement, and I'm talking uh, statistically here. Um, I think also in terms of being able to demonstrate uh, precisely what effect that has in the workplace over time is going to be an interesting study too. Um, you know, the, the time issue may be especially um, difficult, you know, because we're working kind of on the, uh, to use a really bad cliche, the, the uh, leading nature. Um, but I think those are the things that we're going to see in the next year or so, is, is the effects kind of transitioning between education and the workplace. I'm wondering um, if you can address the question of uptake. Do you think that badges will become, will really catch on in that corporate environment where these micro-credentials travel with me throughout my career but don't really add up to a, you know, a, a degree from an academy? Or do you think that, that the, uh, the academy will catch on and begin to figure out how to integrate these, these 
micro shields, badges, and so forth into our current structure of, of credits and degrees and so forth. Any thoughts on that, Dan? Yeah, that's a. I would say all of the above in varied ways um, with varied success. Um, yeah, the DPD project left a big impression on me in that, that the most challenging practices to enact were the ones that involved more formal uh, credentials. Um, the ones that were more successful were more informal. So a lot of the, a, a lot of the projects, that, mo the majority of the projects that tried to get formal uh, endorsements uh, of their badges actually failed. Um, there's, there's a couple of things going on out there. There's a chicken and egg problem. Like the employers want to see somebody with those badges who's good, you know, but the issuers want to see an employer looking for somebody, right? So, so that's happening. Um, you know, some of the badges are being issued sort of redundantly. You know, there's already a very sophisticated ecosystem. Like uh, one of the projects we studied was uh, the uh, Girl Scouts. And well, well, if you think about Girl Scouts, or not Girl Scouts, I'm sorry, I'll take that back, 4-H. So 4-H already had an existing recognition and information ecosystem. They had their ribbons and their trophies and they had their fairs. There was already a whole system in place and so when they try to overlay badges onto that system, uh, the minute they ran into technical and logistical problems, basically everybody abandoned it. So they succeeded in building a badge, e a badge system but they didn't succeed in, on our estimation in building an ecosystem because nobody's using it. And that's because, because it's just not worth the added hassle. Uh, to use it because there's already a whole credentialing ecosystem in place. So that's a, I'm seeing a lot of examples like that. Um, um, I, I think there's a number of institutions. The EDUCAUSE badges, uh, you know, they're being automatically issued if you present at a conference and stuff. Um, that, that makes me a little nervous sometimes because people, it's sort of diminishing the value of badges. Um, you know, they're sort of called attendance badges. I refuse to call them, as a participatory theorist, I refuse to call them participation badges, uh, but I call them attendance badges. So uh, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question exactly, but those are my thoughts. I, I think your observations are, are really uh, interesting. You know, overlaying existing, for example, Girl Scouts report, which is probably not going to work as well, but where we don't have micro-credentials right now, the opportunity exists to bring something new to the table. Uh, a point that my colleague Kyle Peck has driven home to me as I've been working on, on badging a project is the value of the badge is only as good as it's recognized by the community. And, and I think exactly. that, that speaks to that chicken and the egg issue. It doesn't matter what your reputation is if, you know, like, so I like to use the example in my course. Um, because it's near and dear to me. So, so those leader badges were, were, were clearly valued. People complained when we did things that uh, kept people from getting them or that might, they felt might obscure them getting them. Um, now, if somebody was pranking the system somehow and, and, uh, and, and began arguing in the, in the network of the class that, that those badges weren't valid, it really doesn't matter what I say about them. And, and if they, if people conclude that those bad badges aren't meaningful, it doesn't matter what my reputation is or my institution is. Um, Carla Casilli and I have a paper that's coming out in a special issue of, of a journal called the Information Society, um, where I sort of really uh, pushed her to, she's the first author on it, and I asked her to articulate something that really left a huge impression on me early on, and that was, uh, so I'm an assessment theorist, and in my textbook that I use, it says that face validity is an unsanctioned form of validity. Well, and, and so when Carla started writing about validity and talking about how validity in, of badges um, would be probably more informed by uh, P.J. Fogg and other theorists who write about credibility of information on the internet, I kind of, you know, bristled a little bit. And then it didn't take me long to realize that she was absolutely right. She was perfectly right that, uh, you know, traditional notions of construct, criterion, and content validity that are near and dear to us assessment theorists really are going to have to take a back seat to um, notions of, of just information credibility and that, that credibility is going to be constructed in social networks where those earners, uh, you know, share their information. Yeah. 
not interesting. Thank you. Okay, Kyle, is, uh, Kyle Peck is on with us, as you know, and he's asked a question about, um, could you describe a little more of the ecosystem of badges that a university might uh, consider? Uh, Penn State, as you probably know, is also active in this area. Uh, we have uh, Chris Dubs with us and, and Chris Gamrich online with us. We have other people working on badges besides people named Chris, for, by the way. But uh, um, what would you give as a recommendation or a suggestion to us as, as we begin to institute a badge system at Penn State? Start with informal learning. Start with co-curricular learning outcomes. Don't learning outcomes. Don't start with faculty learning. Whatever you do, don't start with faculty learning. Okay. I think um, I think that faculty learning is very problematic because faculty, as you know, are problematic. Um, there's a whole existing network in there to recognize them. Annual report or annual reports and stuff. You know, if 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 the badges that you're issuing don't appear on the whatever, you know, no faculty annual report system you have, don't bother. Yeah, yeah I think um, this has been raised in the, uh, the written discussion on the side. One of the big questions at this point for universities, and I've actually heard this discussed at multiple universities, is, is the concept of a badge on a transcript. Um, and I think it's fair to say that registrars are kind of looking at, you know, should we put a badge on a transcript? You know, what's the difference between a badge and, and a class? And, and, you know, I think that there are some open questions here. Um, I think in all of our, our educations, we can say um, that we, you know, we've taken certain classes and we should be able to do certain things. You know, I mentioned this a little earlier, but at what point does that become the same? And, you know, the strength to a badge is, as anyone listening to this presentation is probably well aware, is that that badge can actually demonstrate uh, what has been learned. You know, the transcript is a little bit more vague. Um, it's not entirely vague. Um, so I think in terms of those ecosystems, you know, a lot of this is going to be developing the meta badge. It's going to be discussing, you know, should this be a group of, of learning activities put together for the learner? Um, is this something that should be individual one-offs? You know, and I think there are some differences in fields, for example, too. Um, kind of getting a little bit more granular. If you look at computer science, for example, you know, you can badge certain um, licensures, certain credentials, um, familiarity with different um, coding systems, things like this. My background, I come from philosophy. Um, I spent, spent way too many hours doing deconstruction. What would the deconstruction badge look like? I'm not going to answer that because it would be weird. Um, but exactly what skills would, would that entail? And I think that each ecosystem has to be different um, and how that plays out on transcripts and furthermore I think the bigger question is how that plays out in, in the, uh, the working world. Let's see if I've got anything else. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions I had, uh, Dan, back when you were speaking about sort of the profits and the non-profits, um, how do you see that evolving over time? Will it be that the open platforms will overtake the, the for-profits, or will they? Will the for-profits provide such value that we'll will subscribe to those services? Yeah, my experience with um, profit is also limited as well. Um, it seems to me like the learning management systems are building in ways of being able to very easily develop and build badges. And the companies are kind of uh, building around this uh, with APIs that go and link into it. And it seems like each company is, is fascinated with this idea of kind of building a backpack, which is really out of You can just, you know, any person can, can use their form of backpack and, and build the badges into it. Um, you know, in terms of predictions, I mean, it's sort of like the stock market, um, who knows. I, I think that what we have found in contrast to older models of business is that there are very good and competitive ways for for-profits and non-profits to work together. Um, and I, I just, you know, I'm no, I'm no economist, but it seems to me like that's a fairly new thing that maybe digital technologies are, are enabling. Um, and I think that there's a lot of room for that to grow. But beyond that, I, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of in Dan's camp that I, I think it's fascinating to watch. 
Um, I think that commercialization um, is a great way of developing things that might not happen um, in nonprofits, but you know, it, it's we'll see. Dan, I'm going to put a, a shameless plug in for, uh, but I'm going to tie it together here. You'll see. Uh, one of the programs that COIL offers is a research initiation grant program, and uh, this is where we sponsor internal to Penn State, but looking always for external partners, research for faculty, staff, and students. One of our questions that came up this morning um, on our chat box was regarding other research areas. What else might we be considering as we're looking at those rigs to, to be exploring around the badge? Um, concepts. Uh, look at the credentialing system as open badges and identity conference uh, over the summer. And Alfie, you know, as we as I was expecting, Alfie really went off on, on the potential negative consequences of badges. And many of the things that we love about badges, such as the evidence circulating in social networks, were just absolutely the worst thing you could ever do in a learning ecosystem. Because, of course, he, you know, and he was quite resolute about it, you know, the research has proven, well, what the research has proven in over a thousand studies is that if you give an arbitrary extrinsic reward to someone for something they already enjoy doing it, their intrinsic motivation, as evidenced by their uh, free choice engagement and activity, will go down. We can replicate that with badges. If we give people arbitrary extrinsic rewards and measure their motivation, as was done uh, in the so-called over-justification study starting in the 70s, we can replicate the negative consequences of extrinsic rewards. But what, 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 what Alfie d doesn't see is that uh, many of the badges were awarded for giving people privileges. So if you think about self-determination theory, their big concern is that giving the award is going to undermine, going to make people feel like pawns and take away their self-determination. Well, it, it, it mystifies me why anyone could argue that giving someone privileges and giving someone power uh, in, as recognition of their learning simultaneously is going to undermine their self-determination. So I'd really, uh, I'm working with uh, uh, Kat Tran and uh, Katerina Schenke at UC Irvine, uh, and we're, we're, we're looking hard at that issue and may uh, set up to do some other studies, but that's where I'm trying to go. Very good. Do two more uh, empirical studies associated with them. This is I don't know if our proposals keep getting rejected by AERA. I may have to rethink it. <laughs> they, don't, uh, they don't seem to like badges at AERA. Well, maybe we'll find a way to connect with you, Dan, in one of our, our small grants here, one of our faculty or researchers. Uh, I think it's a fascinating area and really appreciate uh, you taking the time and James taking the time to join us today. A great a great resource of information. You've stimulated a lot of thought. And uh, maybe we'll catch up with you in six months or, or in a year and see what else we've learned. OK, great. I'll look forward to seeing you in San Antonio, Lawrence. Oh, that sounds good. OK, thank you, Dan. All right, folks. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. It was a pleasure. Terrific. And Bye, all. Thanks, thanks to those who joined us. Um, Virtually, uh, for the Penn State community, I'd remind you that we have the uh, COIL rate submissions that are uh, due on November 15th. If you have ideas, please submit. And Kyle reminded you as well to join our COIL connector. And uh, that is our new intro network system that creates relationships and bonds between people around research interests. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, we're at about a couple hundred now. We're looking to grow that connector. So we'll sign off for now, and uh, thank you again to our presenters. We'll look forward to our next quarter conversations. Bye-bye.